Michael and Ruth are a married couple. They are teaming up for a wilderness expedition. This time, the couple has come to the Amazon rainforest, which spans over 7.8 million square kilometers. They are located 13 kilometers away from the main channel of the Amazon River. Michael plans to first locate a tributary, craft a raft, and return to civilization. They head towards a lower-lying area and find a small stream before noon. Following the direction of the floating leaves, the couple walks downstream. After more than half an hour, Michael notices the sunlight ahead becoming exceptionally bright, indicating an open area. Indeed, they come across a wider river channel, deep enough for rafting, which will take several hours to build. Now, they decide to stop and rest to replenish their energy. Michael chooses a clear space near the river, planning to use nearby trees as posts to construct an elevated shelter. Ruth's task is to gather enough palm leaves. Michael cuts down a large amount of wood, using vines from the rainforest as ropes. He uses one of the tree trunks as a post, with the other three posts being live trees. He constructs a platform over two meters off the ground. While helping Ruth collect palm leaves, he finds a land tortoise on the ground, a perfect source of protein. The tortoise's meat is edible, and its shell can be used to boil water, making it an excellent survival tool. Then, Michael builds a single pitched roof on the platform, covering it from bottom to top with the leaves of the elephant ear palm, completing the shelter. After being bitten by mosquitoes all night in the rainforest, Michael wears a helmet camera the next day to go hunting, as Ruth does not want to eat the cute tortoise. Just when Michael thinks he might return empty handed, he spots a python on the forest floor. He pins the snake's head down with a stick and grabs it by the neck. The snake weighs about 10 kilograms enough to release the tortoise and have a big meal. Since they haven't made fire yet, Michael stores the snake in his shirt to keep it. Next, he focuses on making fire. Michael finds a bamboo grove, cuts down some dry bamboo, and returns to camp to make water storage jars and a container for boiling water. He plans to use the fire saw method, splitting a bamboo in half, scraping bamboo shavings for tinder, cutting a groove in the bamboo piece for friction, placing the tinder behind a hole in the groove, and securing it with a small stick. Finally, he vigorously rubs the two bamboo pieces together. However, due to the rainforest's humidity, they struggle to produce sparks, so they lie flat and complain. Later, Michael finds a flammable resin, scrapes some into the tinder, and rubs for another half hour until the tinder finally smokes. He blows a few breaths and a flame bursts forth. They drink clean, boiled water and kill the python. They take it to the river, skin it, clean the insides, and discard the parts with parasites, keeping a large chunk of edible meat. That night, they stayed by the campfire, roasting snake meat. The thoroughly cooked snake meat tasted surprisingly like chicken, with a smoky flavor that was very aromatic. Michael and Ruth had a full meal and slept comfortably. On the third day of survival, it was time to consider leaving the rainforest. Michael found several balsa trees, which are light and buoyant making them ideal for raft making. He easily chopped down a balsa tree as thick as a soccer ball. At the same time, Ruth stripped the inner fibers of the bark. They cut the balsa wood into five sections, arranged them into a raft shape, and used the bark as rope to tie everything together. The balsa raft had strong buoyancy, enough to support the weight of Michael and Ruth. They floated downstream on the raft, passing through the jungle to the main channel of the Amazon River. Occasionally, they saw other boats on the river, marking the end of their challenge successfully. In the next episode, Michael and Ruth are lost in the Okavango Delta in Botswana, Africa. The area looks beautiful, but is full of dangers, as the nearest people are 80 kilometers away. They must stay and wait for rescue, equipped with only two machetes and some car parts. In other places, they would start by making a fire, but in Africa, they first made long spears for protection. Then they found a brush tree, suitable for making fire with its dry and soft branches. Rubbing by hand was hard, so Michael carved a groove at the top of the spindle and cut a shoelace. He removed the inner core made of seven thin cords, tied loops on both ends, and hooked his thumbs through them. He placed the cord in the spindle's groove for easier and more efficient drilling. After half an hour, Michael successfully drilled out embers and lit the prepared tinder, creating a large fire. Many wild animals fear fire, and it protected Michael and Ruth from potential attacks. With a few minutes of daylight left, they cut a bunch of long grass from nearby to use as a mattress in their vehicle. 
safely spending their first night of survival. The next day, Michael planned to find food, obtain fresh water, and strengthen their camp. He took the battery box and the radiator water tank from the car to use as containers. At the lake near their camp, Michael kept watch for animals while Ruth bent down to collect water. Although the water looked clear, it was contaminated by hippos and crocodiles, so they needed to boil it for five minutes before drinking. After cleaning and cooling the water in plastic bottles, Mikkel and Ruth quenched their thirst and focused on finding food. Michael's hunting strategy was to follow animal tracks. Along the way, he saw many large bones and eventually found a recently deceased hartebeest under some bushes, likely killed by a lion. Ruth wanted to leave, but Mikkel saw it as a great foraging opportunity, guessing the lion had left to drink water and rest. They decided to use this time to cut and take the hartebeest's thigh. Ruth was assigned to cut the leg while Michael kept watch with a spear. The hartebeest's thick skin made the task difficult. Soon, birds in the trees began to chirp, a warning that large animals might be approaching. Under extreme tension, Ruth gave up, so Michael quickly cut off the hartebeest's leg with a knife. Ruth started by slicing the skin and cutting off a large piece of fresh red meat, which would be their dinner. They hung the remaining parts in a tree, hoping other carnivores would not reach them. Before eating, Michael and Ruth had to fortify their camp. They mimicked local natives by cutting a large amount of acacia with long thorns to create a protective barrier. Michael then dismantled the car's front grill to use as a grill over the fire. By the time the meat was cooked, it was dark. This was their first meal in two days. The dense, juicy heart of beast meat was delicious. Every bite provided them with much-needed calories. That night, they had everything they needed for a comfortable sleep, food, drink, and protection against insects and predators. Unfortunately, on the third day, they woke to bad news. The meat hung in the tree had been eaten by animals, forcing them to search for food again. This time, they encountered a nest of aggressive African bees hidden in a narrow tree crevice. After careful consideration, Michael decided not to risk it. They returned to the lake to look for food. Michael spotted a small crocodile under the water. Quietly approaching from behind, he grabbed and held the crocodile's neck tightly. Back on shore, Ruth killed it by stabbing its neck. Due to the tough crocodile skin, they only cut off the tail and took several pieces of meat. Back at camp, they cooked the meat on the wire grate over charcoal until it was crispy on the outside and tender inside. The crocodile meat, rich in protein and firm yet not greasy, was their meal. After eating, they slept until 8 a.m. the next day. Michael and Ruth then pushed their car into a sunny clearing, started a fire, and placed a spare tire on it to create a large amount of black smoke. They also used the car's rearview mirrors to reflect sunlight as a distress signal to pilots. When the rescue helicopter arrived, both the smoke and mirror reflections were clearly visible, marking the successful end of their challenge. The wetlands of Louisiana, USA, cover about 14 million hectares and are filled with alligators and water snakes. In this episode, a couple decides to take on the survival challenge. They begin with parachutes on their backs, hanging from tree branches, equipped with only two dragon-slaying knives and half a bottle of water. The couple spend some effort to free themselves from the parachutes and land on the ground. Michael plans to scout the area for dry land while Ruth stays put. Michael encounters a small alligator during his exploration. He breaks off a tree branch, uses it to engage the alligator, then circles behind to hold its head and eventually secures its jaws shut. This alligator is enough for a substantial meal for Michael and Ruth, but they lack fire and water and haven't found solid land yet. After demonstrating his capture technique, Michael releases the alligator. Unable to bear the solitude, Ruth climbs a tree. When Michael returns, she cuts down the parachute. With just a couple of hours before dark, Michael decides to use the parachute to make a hammock to keep them off the dangerous water surface at night. They tie the parachute ends to trees and secure them with square knots. They spend the night squeezed together on the hammock. The next morning, after drinking their last sip of water, they pack up and set off to find a river. By noon, they reach land. The priority is to make a fire for boiling water to replenish energy before continuing their search for the river. Ruth's highly nearsighted glasses prove useful. Michael gathers dry leaves from the ground, crushes them slightly to make tinder, and uses the convex lens to focus sunlight on it. After patiently waiting for the tinder to smolder, Michael blows on it, and a flame bursts forth. Once the fire is strong, Ruth uses Michael's headscarf to filter out large impurities from the river water and fills a bottle. 
Michael uses a string to suspend the bottle over the fire. The plastic bottle doesn't melt due to the water's protection, and the water is boiled to kill any germs. While waiting for the water to cool, the couple cuts the parachute in half to make two hammocks and a waterproof roof for their shelter. Once the previously boiled water has cooled, Michael and Ruth rehydrate. They plan to catch crayfish in the swamp for dinner. While searching along the swamp's edge, they unexpectedly find a water snake eating an eel. Michael seizes this opportunity, pins the snake with a stick, and beheads it. The eel, rich in fat and protein, becomes their dinner, while the skinny snake is used as bait to attract crayfish. Ruth stays at camp to cook the eel, while Michael uses a bag made from the parachute to catch crayfish by the swamp. Soon Michael brings back many crayfish to the camp. The cooked eel is fatty, very fragrant, and juicy. After finishing the eel, the lobster tails are also cooked. That night, a heavy rain suddenly falls, but the parachute-made roof protects them. By morning, the fire is still burning, and they are dry. Today, Mikkel plans to catch some large game to have a real feast. He cuts down two tree trunks of the right thickness, sharpens their tips into spears, and hardens them over the fire. Once ready, the hunt begins. They walk along the water's edge, looking for animals coming to feed or drink. Soon, Michael spots something moving in the water. Approaching, he discovers it's a wild boar. He jumps into the water, lunging at the boar, but a tree branch catches his helmet camera, and he watches helplessly as the boar escapes. He now returns to camp to dry his wet clothes. Though he didn't catch the boar, on the way back, he spots an opossum. He plans to knock it down himself and have his wife dispatch it. Michael quickly climbs the tree and pokes the opossum down with his spear. However, Ruth, who is afraid even to kill a chicken, fails to control it, allowing the opossum to climb back up. Michael goes back up the tree, pokes it down again, and pins it until Ruth overcomes her fear and kills it. On the third night of survival, they eat the opossum. Michael grills it until it's crispy, making it very appetizing. Ruth cuts off a leg, bites into it, and praises the good roast, noting the smoky flavor that makes the opossum meat especially delicious. A starving Michael can't wait and begins to feast, enjoying the crispy chicken-like taste as they replenish their bodies with various nutrients. They eat well that night and sleep until the next morning. Michael packs up everything, digs a hole in a piece of rotting wood and places charcoal inside to keep a smoldering fire as they move. They continue eastward in search of a river. After walking six kilometers, they hear the sound of a motorboat. Michael quickly cuts a piece of the parachute, ties it to the top of his spear as a flag, and a motorboat appears in the camera's view, successfully ending this episode's challenge. 240 kilometers south of Australia, Tasmania Island has seen over a thousand ships swallowed by its seas. Many people forced to survive on deserted beaches start their survival there. This episode, Michael and Ruth face such a challenge. Michael cuts the bottom of their raft with a knife, and they fall into the cold seawater. But before this, they had already packed spare clothes and a camera in plastic bags. After swimming to shore with the leaking raft and changing into dry clothes to prevent hypothermia, Michael finds a suitable camping spot nearby and prepares to survive and wait for rescue. In a land of weird rocks, he finds a spot shielded from the wind on three sides, with the open side facing the sun and the sea, a perfect spot for camping. Michael goes back to find Ruth. The couple packs up everything and heads to the spot Michael had found earlier. They use the leaky raft, securing it with rope at the top to complete their shelter. Before it gets completely dark, Michael plans to start a fire with a bow drill, ensuring they won't freeze overnight. He uses a curved tree branch as the bow, a knife sheath's rope for the string, and soft wood for the base and drill spindle. Ruth finds conical seashells to use as handles to apply pressure to the spindle. Together, they manage to start a fire. Ruth holds the shells to apply pressure, and Michael pulls vigorously. Soon, sparks appear, and they get the fire going before dark. That night, they go to sleep hungry. The next day, Michael prioritizes finding fresh water. He plans to build a solar still. He digs a hole, fills it with seaweed, and covers it with a plastic bag, securing the edges with stones. The sun evaporates the water from the seaweed, which condenses on the plastic. Meanwhile, Ruth is sent to the beach to find shells to hold water. The shells she finds are perforated, so she returns with a large bundle of seaweed instead. Following local indigenous methods, they sharpen sticks to string the seaweed into a bowl shape. 
After several attempts, they successfully create a seaweed bowl and place it at the bottom of the pit. They put a stone on the plastic above to direct the dripping water into the bowl. The distilled water is limited, so Michael must also search for a freshwater stream. He heads inland and after walking for some time, the vegetation becomes greener. On the ground, he spots animal droppings near a likely water source. As expected, he soon finds a small swamp. The water is contaminated with animal waste, posing a risk of bacterial infection. Michael uses his headscarf to filter out the larger impurities from the water, planning to boil it for drinking back at camp. Meanwhile, Ruth searches for food along the coast. Tasmania is one of the world's largest abalone exporters, which she hopes to find. Abalone shells resemble stones. Ruth finds a suspicious one and pries it open with a knife, discovering it is indeed abalone. The couple returns to camp with their finds. Michael with about 7.5 liters of fresh water and Ruth with two abalones and several sea snails. Before eating, they must replenish their bodies with sufficient fresh water. Ruth goes to the solar still, lifts the plastic, finding about 200 milliliters of sweet-tasting fresh water. However, this small amount is not enough for their daily needs. Michael came up with the idea of boiling swamp water. He heated stones in the fire and then placed them in a seaweed bowl. The stones heated the water to a boil, making it safe to drink. Just after replenishing their fluids, the sky suddenly changed, signaling an imminent storm. They had to reinforce their shelter quickly by dismantling the raft's roof, placing a thick log as a horizontal beam across two stone walls and setting up a frame with thinner branches on one side. They covered it with the raft and secured it with rope to form a roof, managing to strengthen their shelter before the rain. By then, the abalone by the fire was cooked. Ruth used a knife to peel the meat directly from the shell. Eating them quickly replenished their bodies with much-needed nutrients, especially since these were tastier than other wild foods. On their third day of survival, their task was to find as much food as possible. Ruth searched the beach for protein-rich abalone and sea snails. Michael ventured inland for food containing vitamins and carbohydrates. The first thing he spotted was an edible grass, its roots rich in carbohydrates and with a fresh taste. Next, Michael found some coastal apples, rich in vitamin C and great tasting. Ruth, in addition to finding abalone and sea snails, also found raspberries near the beach. The resources here were incredibly rich. The food they gathered made up a full table. Edible grass, coastal apples, large abalone, raspberries, and blueberries. Some abalone were still roasting on the fire. Michael and Ruth started with some grass roots as an appetizer, followed by roasted grass seeds. Australian Aborigines would grind them into flour to make bread, which tasted a bit like animal feed. That day, they finally achieved sustainable living and slept until 8 a.m. Michael and his wife went to the beach to set up a signal fire, as most rescue operations would start at this time. They needed to provide a clear sign for the rescuers. As the helicopter, arranged by the production team, approached, they heard the rotor blades and added fresh branches to the fire to create a lot of smoke, guiding the pilot to them smoothly, ending their challenge successfully. In this episode, the couple came to the Chihuahua Desert in northern Mexico. Michael and Ruth had to survive four days before a rescue team's helicopter could reach them. Finding a water source was their top priority. To quickly locate potential water sources, climbing to a high vantage point was undoubtedly a shortcut. Michael and Ruth climbed a nearby pile of rocks. From the top, they saw an oasis at the foot of a distant mountain, likely a depression retaining some water for plants to grow, so they decided to head towards that oasis. The Chihuahua Desert can reach temperatures up to 48 degrees Celsius during the day. To reduce sweat loss, they slowed their pace while traveling to minimize sweating. Michael spotted a barrel cactus on the ground. By sucking the flesh of the cactus, they could obtain a small amount of water. However, this cactus was rotten and no longer edible. Later, Michael found a healthy one in a pile of rocks. He cut it open to reveal moist flesh, unlike the dry one before. The first piece of flesh, was for Ruth. Ruth said it tasted like a juicy potato. Under these conditions, they couldn't swallow the flesh because digesting food also uses up the body's water. So, they sucked on the flesh like sugarcane, only extracting the moisture. They continued towards the oasis, constantly searching for cacti to hydrate along the way. Suddenly, a dried-up riverbed appeared in their view. 
a good place to look for water. If it had rained in the last half month, there might still be water stored underground. The couple descended into the riverbed and saw many signs of flood erosion, but the ground was completely dry with no trace of fresh water. They reached the oasis hoping to find water, but the surface still looked very dry. Michael chose a lower area and tried digging. After digging about 30 centimeters, he gave up. Besides the soil becoming darker, there was no water. At this point, Michael had to resort to extreme measures for hydration. He cut open a barrel cactus and scooped out its flesh, then urinated on it. In desperate situations, recycling urine is an option. Ruth could hardly bear it and almost vomited. Michael, not wanting to waste it, consumed it all himself. That day, they didn't have enough time to make a fire. They just cleared a spot on the ground, laid down fresh branches and desert yellow flowers as a makeshift mattress, and slept through the night. The next morning, Michael took his equipment to go hunting, hoping to find rabbit holes or bird nests. However, after a long search, he found neither. As they were packing up to leave in search for water sources, Ruth saw a rat enter their camp. Michael killed it with a rock, then wrapped it in desert yellow flowers and packed it in Ruth's backpack, planning to roast it once they found a water source. Their plan was to head to the canyon across from them because its vegetation was greener and it was the lowest point, likely to have water. Along the way, they also searched for barrel cacti and any other moisture-rich plants for hydration. This time, Michael found a large spherical cactus. Despite its many thorns, its flesh was water-rich and tasty. By sucking the flesh of these cacti, they could replenish a significant amount of water before continuing on their journey. Following an animal trail, they stumbled upon a good discovery. Following it might lead them to an animal's den for food or possibly to a water source. They followed the animal trail without knowing how long they had walked when a dense vegetation area appeared before them. Michael wanted to dig a hole to see if they could find water. However, the result was once again disappointing as the ground was extremely dry. The search for water proved much more difficult than expected. Finally, Ruth couldn't hold on any longer. Dehydrated and suffering from heat stroke, she lost her ability to move. She felt a splitting headache and nausea. Seeing the serious situation, Michael quickly called a doctor from a kilometer away. After drinking mineral water with electrolytes and salts, her condition somewhat improved, and her body temperature returned to normal. After the doctor left, Michael wanted to make a fire to keep his wife warm and allow her a good night's sleep. He found an abandoned bird's nest to use as tinder. By rubbing two dry sticks quickly, he managed to create sparks after two failed attempts and successfully ignited the tinder to start a fire. That night, Michael roasted the rat and Ruth's condition improved. On the third day of survival, they aimed to find as much food and water as possible. Behind the camp on the animal trail, Michael spotted a rattlesnake sunning itself. Besides that, there was nothing else. He pinned the snake's head down with a stick and killed it with his knife. Back at the camp, he cleaned the snake and roasted it over the fire. The snake had little meat, so they had to crush and eat even the bones to get enough energy. After eating the rattlesnake, the day passed. Upon waking up, it was time to leave. The rescue helicopter was within a 32-kilometer radius of them. If they stayed in the low vegetation's shadow, the pilots could have a hard time spotting them. Therefore, Michael and Ruth climbed to the nearby mountaintop. As the helicopter approached, their challenge ended.